One, Lorna, over to you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly public health update and media briefing with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Verhilly, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and also joining us today is Health Officer Travis Gales, Dr. Gales, also Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is the Director of the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. Reporters, you should all have already permission to record. If you do not, please use the chat box to ask for it. And today we do have a hard stop at 1.20 in the afternoon. And with that, let's get started, Mr. County Executive. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us again for our weekly press briefing. Um, I guess this must be the most exciting thing in happening in Washington on Wednesday afternoon. That's good. Um, so I'll talk a little, start with our COVID and uh, vaccination rates. Uh, today, our uh, positivity rate was 1.57, and our case rate um, per 100,000 was 3.78. Uh, we are um, absolutely one of the lowest jurisdictions in the nation of the large jurisdictions. And, um, and now we've been joined by Middlesex, New Jersey is one of two uh, locations with a case rate of four or less that are east of the Mississippi River. Um, it gives you an idea where we sit. Um, as you mentioned last week, we switched over to using the CDC's vaccination rate numbers as the benchmark. And just to remind people, we switched because the CDC numbers included uh, numbers for county residents who were vaccinated outside of the state system. And they weren't able, the state wasn't able to capture people, for example, getting vaccinated in DC. So it gives us a little fuller picture. It makes a difference of a few percentage points, but we wanted to at least have the most accurate sense of where we were. Um, we still are just, like I said, we're at 48.2% of our residents have received both doses of Pfizer or Moderna or a single dose of Johnson & Johnson. We expect to hit the 50% threshold by the end of this week or early next week, and that would trigger a two week period uh, for full vaccination needed to move to phase three of the Board, and Health, Re Board of Health Regulation. At, at this point, the county would be fully aligned with state guidance. Um, the governor's press conference today, I have no idea. This is the same with all the other press conferences for the last year. Um, we don't know anything about it until he actually does his press conference. We get no lead, not even a couple of minutes before. So usually uh, what we find out, we find out when you find out. So I don't know what to expect. I don't know what he's going to do today. Um, but we're going to monitor it and uh, we'll, uh, we'll probably have responses to it later. But, you know, there's a limited number of things you can do at this point. Uh, not much else left to accelerate. Uh, so we'll see what comes this afternoon. Um, we got good news this week that Pfizer's uh, vaccine has been dosed, um, is going to get an FDA approval for 12 to 50, 12 to 15 year olds. We expect final approval um, today, and then we will be able to begin uh, vaccinating this cohort uh, as early as tomorrow. We are allowing 12 to 15 year olds to be pre-registered now, and we have over 5,000 pre-registered in this age group. And the supply to get them registered and vaccinated, um, and we have the supply to get these folks registered and vaccinated quickly. In preparation for this announcement, we've been administering more Moderna, more, more Moderna in our clinics because we're expecting a rush on the other vaccines, and so we want to make sure that um, that we're not we're not conflicting with these two. Uh, Moderna is not approved for the 12 year olds yet. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, vaccine hesitancy. Um, this, you know, this is a real thing. Uh, demand continues to be declining, which is, you know, been of great concern to us. Um, there was Maryland Health Department did a tracking poll on vaccines, uh, which is up here now. And I think you can see, um, you know, the hesitancy. And, and who comprises the most hesitant people? Political independents are 57%, uh, which is greater than Republicans at 33 and Democrats at 22. Uh, that means more likely to express hesitancy. 
and 34% of them said they definitely or probably will not vaccinate, and another 23% are not sure. Um, the problem with all this is that um, it will delay our ability to achieve herd immunity. I mean, the simplest thing for us and the best health path for everybody, wherever you are, would have been to get people vaccinated. We, we would be through this. We'd have high rates of um, vaccinated population. We would essentially um, achieve as close to herd immunity as you could get. Uh, when people are hesitant and they don't get vaccinated, that means there will continue to be a population out there who can get sick. Um, if they get sick, they still have the potential to, to reinfect people. It's not a lot as far as we know right now, but it's a possibility. And of course, the, the worst thing about vaccine continued, not vaccine, but the virus continuing to spread is that just enhances the virus's ability to mutate. And, you know, we've seen these mutations occur, you know, around the world. They occurred as, uh, you know, as the virus spread, and that's what viruses do. That's part of their MO is they mutate. And so the sooner you stop the spread, the sooner you reduce the possibilities for mutations. And uh, we've been lucky so far. Um, I read something this morning that, you know, the thinking was on the Indian virus um, version of it, that um, it may be susceptible to the vaccines. And that's a good thing, as long as these things can be knocked out with the vaccines, that's a big help. But we continue to worry about this as, as we go forward. Um, and you can see the rest of the high hesitancy groups. So last week, we sent out 147,000 text messages to targeted areas of the county that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Next week, we will be hosting a FEMA mobile vaccination unit, a standalone trailer capable of doing 200 doses a day, and they'll be doing 1,000 doses for this period. And we're looking at Lake Forest Mall uh, as the host location. And um, the MAX vaccine unit will return 6-4 to 6-13, and we're working to identify another convenient community location that week. And this week, uh, we announced the openings of six library buildings on June 1st. Um, throughout the pandemic, libraries have been open for access to their book collections. And so people have taken out literally hundreds of thousands of books and uh, continue to use the library that way. Uh, we have had a hiring freeze in place and we did not uh, start hiring people back until we knew we were going to open. We didn't see any point in hiring people and then paying them not to work. That did not seem prudent. Uh, now that we know where we where we are going, we are hiring people back to fill those positions. Um, and we do have a group of people who are high risk and still teleworking. Our senior center openings on the June 14th Holiday Park and Damascus Senior Centers will open. The Recreation Center, the Recreation Department manages seven senior centers throughout the county. Uh, the Wheaton and White Oak Senior Center continue to be COVID vaccine sites. The Long Branch Senior Center uh, will continue to be a homeless shelter. It should be, recre sorry, Recreation Department. And uh, Margaret Schweinhout and North Potomac Senior Centers will provide summer programming for hundreds of youth until the full reopening in August. And the Rec Department will continue to expand virtual programs and outdoor programs for seniors. Uh, last week, there was a ruling by a federal judge vacating the CDC's temporary halt to evictions, and it's extremely concerning to us. And uh, it was halted over the authority of the CDC to do this. And, you know, frankly, we're hoping that uh, the president issues the order under an agency that has the authority to do this because the judge didn't rule that it couldn't be done, simply that the agency that did it didn't have the authority. In the meantime, Montgomery County is still under the state's executive order and it's still in effect and it helps protect um, our tenants. Um, if any resident is in the process of being evicted, they need to reach out to us, know their rights, and apply for rental relief uh, from the resources that we have. And the federal judge ruling is another reason why um, I firmly believe Hogan needs to keep but extend the eviction, the eviction moratorium throughout our state. The, the problem is if you end the eviction moratorium on the day you decide that the virus is no longer 
requires emergency powers. And if the eviction protection goes away, businesses are not automatically reopening on that day. There are a lot of businesses who are permanently closed. There are a lot of businesses who, once they reopen, are going to take some time to uh, even get up to full speed. And so the recovery of the jobs is likely to be slower than the recovery of the businesses. And that's going to mean that uh, simply deciding that because the virus is gone, you can um, assume that people will be employed. This is likely to linger. And, you know, best guesses are six months at least um, before we get major um, replacement of the workforce. So we're hoping that the extensions cover not just the virus period, but also the post-virus period as businesses recover. Um, and we also are encouraging tenants to contact uh, the county site on, um, on housing because there are things you have to do. The governor's order is different than the CDC's order. Um, it is critical that uh, residents understand what paperwork they need to have um, to, um, to be able to apply for rental relief, but also what they need to bring into court. Um, so we encourage people um, to please contact the county regarding what we can best do to help you prepare in the event that uh, you're going to be facing eviction. And I recently joined other county executives from across the state in a letter to the governor that did request an extension of the moratorium on evictions. In non-COVID issues, um, we continue to work and make progress. Uh, the county government, you know, our assumption has been from the beginning that uh, we need to deal with all the issues that pre predated COVID and that they were going to be here when COVID winds down. And it's not surprising that all of them are still here. Uh, we made a, a couple announcements. Uh, we're beginning the Reimagining School Safety and Students Wellbeing Steering Committee. There are 32 members, government officials, um, both from the county executive's office and the county council as well as um, MCPD, MCPS, um, and most importantly, we have student members. Um, there are three students, two high school, one middle school, three teachers, three principals, three security staff, um, four from the police department, and three from MCPS and, and Montgomery County Health. Um, so we have professionals engaged in this. This initiative is going to help us rethink and reshape our policies in our schools and provide uh, the best social and mental health support for our students. But I want to reiterate um, that I've already made the decision that we're not going back to SROs and SROs will not be patrolling the schools. That is our starting point in how we develop a program that provides more appropriate mental health support for our students. Um, I look forward to seeing this committee's work and we'll get that report out as soon as possible. And there may be some interim decisions that we need to make earlier, and we'll let people know what those decisions are as soon as we get to the point that we've got an agreement. Um, as I said in our press announcement last month, month, it's pretty much now or never in this endeavor. You know, we are being pushed to do this. We have um, had you know the same push for a while. Uh, we seem to have reached a moment in time when. There is a broader agreement on what we need to do, and we need to take advantage of it and, uh, and do the things that we've set out to do. So stay tuned for more on that. I want to congratulate the Department of General Services, um, who brought us more good news this week toward our goal of zero emissions. Um, today, we're announcing an agreement with Alpha Structure to deploy an integrated microgrid and electric bus charging infrastructure P3 project at the Brookfield Bus Depot in Silver Spring. The bus, the project's going to enable at least 44 ride-on buses to transition from diesel to electric, which reduces their lifetime emissions by over 155,000 tons of CO2. And it's a big deal in getting us toward our goals. And we are going to be looking at a second center, um, a second one of our bus depots for a second microgrid system. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gales. Good afternoon. Excuse me. And happy Wednesday. Uh, happy belated Mother's Day to all the mothers. Uh, and hope you had a good uh, holiday on Sunday. Uh, I don't have many updates beyond what the county executive has mentioned. Uh, happy to take questions. 
I would like to emphasize that we, uh, consistent with other jurisdictions, we are awaiting the final announcement from the uh, Committee on Immunization Practices to render its decision on uh, the use of the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. Our team has been planning for a number of weeks now, anticipating that happening, and we'll be making public uh, some of the provisions that we're putting into place uh, to increase access points for young people uh, to get vaccinated. As was referenced, uh, we are uh, permitting folks to register their children online uh, through our pre-registration portal. And when that announcement is made and it becomes official, 12 to 15 year olds can access any of the places and points where vaccines are distributed as long as they are Pfizer vaccines. They are the only ones that will have been approved for use in that population. So if you are looking for sites to get a vaccine for your 12 to 15 year old, make sure to look for a site that offers the Pfizer vaccine. Again, as that is the only one that will have been approved for that age group to this point. Uh, another important point to point out, and again, we will be releasing more of this information, is we've talked in the past about consent. Uh, the policy and approach that we will be taking for our uh, clinics will be that parents will not have to be present for their children to get vaccinated. However, they will have had to have completed the consent process through prep mod when scheduling, and the children will need to bring some, bring some form of proof of identity to confirm their age to make sure that they are appropriate in the category and can safely receive the vaccine. We will be standing up additional clinics over the weekend to help facilitate and foster this, uh, this increased eligibility. And we are working with our partners in both the non-public school group as well as the uh, public school uh, MCPS to identify some potential sites within the next week to do some youth-specific clinics to be able to, again, increase access points to get that population covered. As the county executive mentioned, we're continuing to make good progress in the areas of the percentage of our residents being vaccinated, both in terms of those who have received the first dose, as well as those who will be fully vaccinated as defined by us previously in terms of getting a dose and being two weeks outside of that uh, to have achieved maximal protection. I will stop there, but happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Dr. Stoddard, do you have opening remarks? Yeah, just a couple. Uh, in furtherance of both what the county executive and Dr. Gales said, we have had a number of people show up at the mass vaccination site today uh, seeking to get their 12 to 15 year old vaccinated. Um, while we fully endorse the enthusiasm associated with getting uh, young people vaccinated, uh, we obviously cannot offer those vaccinations until the CDC has approved and opined and the Maryland Department of Health has done so as well. We do anticipate that happening today, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to offer uh, those vaccinations starting tomorrow. We have throughout this week, uh, largely both at the county sites, but also at the mass vaccination sites, preferentially used the Moderna vaccine earlier in the week, which allowed us to save uh, a Pfizer vaccine, which obviously is the only vaccine that will be permitted for 12 to 15 year olds to be utilized later in the week for those populations. And so we do expect we'll be able to, to meet the need of the community uh, the more the 5,000 who have pre-registered, plus those who are going to make on-demand appointments or just simply walk up to the sites. We, we expect to have a Pfizer vaccine well into the next week with what we, what we currently have on hand. So um, obviously uh, for those people who try, who are making appointments or trying to show up today, please do just wait until that CDC and Maryland Department of Health approval comes through. I will just make one comment on the, on the, on the gas issue. Um, we are obviously monitoring that in concert with our state partners and federal partners. Um, while we don't see you know, any, any issues as it relates to our county supply of gasoline for our public safety vehicles and, and throughout you know, county vehicles, we are seeing some uh, public gas stations that are running out of gas. Those are largely driven by consumer behavior, not some shortage in the gas supply. There's some panic buying and we wanna obviously discourage people from doing that. It, it, it obviously doesn't serve uh, anyone's benefit for people to be hoarding gasoline uh, there's no there's no evidence to suggest that that's necessary, just as there was no evidence to suggest that hoarding toilet paper ended up being necessary either. So obviously we've seen those things happen and we we want to discourage them and uh, just just clearly state that there isn't there is not a good rationale to do it right now. So um, we want to, you know, just encourage people to go about their normal habits. And um, I don't, I don't, we don't expect there's going to be issues as a result of that. 
That's all. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. And now let's begin with the Q&A portion of this presentation. First questions come from uh, Kate Ryan, WTOP. Kate has questions for uh, three officials. Kate. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start on, um, and forgive me, uh, the, the fact that parents do not need to be present for ages 12 to 15 to get their shots. Is that correct? Because that seems different from yesterday, uh, Dr. Gales. I wanted to just clarify that. Um, and again, what kind of documentation will they have to provide to prove age? Do they need a birth certificate or a social security number? Thank you, Kay, for the question. And you're right, we did, we were taking a different approach, but after consulting with our colleagues at the state level in terms of our immunization program and also talking with uh, several other jurisdictions, uh, we decided to stick with the policy that we have had in place for a while that we use for our uh, flu vaccines, for example, for kids. So hence the pivot to, uh, to move to this model. We also are hopeful that by making these provisions, and again, this is consistent with an approach that we follow in our other clinics uh, previously, is that hopefully it will remove some of the potential barriers that may prevent some of the children from being able to come in. Now let's be very clear, there still are the provisions that are required in terms of the parents providing consent for the students to move for the, the children uh, to move forward in terms of getting vaccinated and we would still expect when or if the children came in without the parents that having had that consent already in place through the, the scheduling system and prep mod that they would still need to have some type of identification uh, to prove their age whether it's a birth certificate uh, and some type of ID uh, state ID or something like that or a passport or their school ID with some type of a photo or their name to confirm who they are and some, some type of uh, document to confirm that they are um, at least 12 years of age. Got that, thank you. And Dr. Stoddard, you talked about, you know, the enthusiasm that people had. Do you have, and again, I know there's no study team there, but do you have a, an outline, a broad outline of who's bringing their kids in? Are these some of the harder to reach populations who are eager to get their children vaccinated? And do you yet have plans, concrete plans yet with the schools to do these at schools as well? I'll let Dr. Gales talk about that second point because I think he's touched on it already. But uh, as far as what we're seeing already, um, a mix. I mean, I, I don't think there's any particular population that we've seen disproportionately. I, I, I think typically um, those, I mean, in all in all phases of this, particularly where there's a opportunity for walk up or easy access, people with access and people who can uh, can can you know typically afford to take off or bring children in are right. who you'll see first, and that's that's always the case. Um, but obviously, that's why we're going to use a balance of the pre-registration and also sort of the targeted uh, open appointments and and uh, walk up opportunities to try and use all three of those in combination to make make it available and equitable. And so we'll, we, we will be applying our equity framework to those people who pre-registered. But, but again, this is a very different situation when, when the first phase of the vaccine opened because this is a much smaller population and we've got a much bigger amount of vaccine this time around. And so we do not expect to have to um, pick and choose who will get the vaccine this time around for the most part. And so I think it'll be readily available to all to, to all who wish to get it for the 35 to 45,000 uh, young people who are who are eligible who will become eligible and so um, I'll let Dr. Gales talk a little bit more about some of the work we're doing at, with MCPS. Okay and then I have one last follow-up with Dr. Stoddard but Dr. Gales on the concrete plans with schools Sure. So we uh, are finalizing details, so we're not ready to say exactly Clinic X will be here on this date, but okay. we have worked with, uh, in addition to the, the public health team working to schedule logistics, uh, we had received uh, on a town hall that Dr. Stoddard and I did last week with uh, non-public schools about a host of different issues. We did request that if any uh, schools were interested in hosting a, a vaccine clinic to submit uh, their idea and proposal. Uh, we did receive from uh, a proposal from one school that we've been in contact with to talk through some potential opportunities early next week. Similarly, we have been working with our MCPS colleagues 
around uh, messaging and uh, to, to, out, to provide outreach to parents and their kids. A similar effort has also been uh, worked on with our comms team and working with non-public school leadership as well. And we also are working with them to potentially identify a school site where we could do a clinic. We anticipate that one may be uh, a little bit smoother given that we were in the schools doing the vaccine clinics early on uh, as part of the, the, the vaccine distribution process. And the other thing that I would emphasize is that as we move forward to add to what Dr. Stoddard mentioned, we are in a very different place now than where we were in the early vaccine distribution process for a host of reasons, including increased supply, as well as we are at a point now where private providers also are getting access to be able to distribute vaccines in their offices. And mm. in particular for pediatricians, uh, the, the state last over the last couple of weeks has sent notices encouraging pediatric offices to uh, if they aren't already registered in Immunet, but to get registered in Immunet so that they can receive vaccines directly as another source uh, of, of another source of, of point of contact, because we know some parents prefer to go through their pediatric provider in these types of matters. Got it. And Dr. Starr, just very quickly, on the gas situation, um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission put out some tweets this morning on urging people not to put these things in containers other than gas containers. There have been some relatively horrifying, uh, you know, tweets, footage of people uh, putting gasoline from the pump into plastic bags, open containers, et cetera. Could you just speak to that and, and mention to people who may just be panicky and not thinking that this is really not a good practice? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So obviously putting, um, Putting gasoline into a uh, any container that is not uh, exclusive, uh, specifically designed to receive gasoline, is a bad practice in and of itself. Uh, storing gasoline uh, in in homes is also not, particularly in large quantities. It's one thing if you're filling up your your tank for your uh, lawnmower, for example. It's an entirely different thing to be hoarding large uh, quantities of gasoline in your, in, in your home. Uh, I, I think that the key thing here is, and, and as the more information comes out about the Colonial Pipeline, what's becoming increasingly clear is that the interruption to service is, is not as dramatic as um, people have people fear it is. And what I mean by that is, is that some of the interruptions have been more about the quantity of gasoline flowing as opposed to the total, as opposed to a total shutdown of the gasoline flat traveling uh, along that pipeline. And so. Much of what we are seeing across the country, and this is not unique to Montgomery County, the state of Maryland, or any of the DMV region, uh, is behavioral changes that people have made out of concern that there will be some shortage to come. And they are therefore driving the shortage with that behavior. And so I think the key message is that there is no um, energy infrastructure rationale right now to suggest that we're going to have a shortage and that people's behavior is the only thing that's causing these temporarily, temporary, you know, sellouts of gasolines at gas stations. And so uh, there's no need to hoard it. There was no need to hoard toilet paper. And we said that back then too. But obviously this is a little bit more uh, sensitive because, you know, you can cause short-term allergies by, by human behavior. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're just encouraging people not to participate in that. And it makes it better for everyone so that whenever you need gasoline, you can readily access it, readily receive it at a, at a station. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kate. Next question comes from Dominique Maria Bonesi from WAMU, and the questions are for you, Mr. County Executive. Dominique. Hi, thank you, Mr. County Executive. Um, I'm curious to know there are around 600 students with MCPS that are on a waiting list to get into school for this year still um, and these are students who, who want to be in-person learning in school. I just wonder, I know you said you had a, a work group getting together trying to figure out how to safely get students back into school. Is this going to be the case going into the next school year where we expect to see students you know on this wait list still or I mean there's only about a month left of school. How, how does this work? Actually it's, it's, it's two different things. The, the, the group we've put together is um, is basically looking at how what's the best way for the county and the school system to address the mental health needs of the students. So we are not looking at um, 
the waiting list or what the school rules are for opening. We're strictly looking at really focusing on how many social workers and how much uh, support do we need to provide in the high schools in particular and probably the middle schools. So issues of who, who comes back to school and when they come back to school are strictly the province of the school system. And this is the first I've heard about it, but even hearing about it, I'm not able to make any decisions. This is really a discussion that needs to be had with uh, the school system. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question better than that, but it is the separation between schools and the uh, government that exists throughout the state. I can only add that in our conversations with MCPS that they have, they intend and have intended for some time that the fall would be a more, uh, would be essentially a normal school year. Um, uh, obviously right. some of the three and six foot distancing requirements set forth by CDC ha have, you know, they designed schools around those. And uh, even Dr. Walensky, the director of the CDC has already come out and publicly said that she believes that next year those requirements will not be in place or at least not in the, the manner that they are currently. And that will allow for, you know, uh, a, a full, uh, complete in-person school experience in, in the fall. And Dr. Stoddard, would you happen to know if, if students that are on this waiting list right now to get into school in person, if they'll be able to within the last one or two months of school? Don't, I don't know. Um, uh, again, obviously, this is this is not an I don't know because you know, uh, as the county executive said, we we don't we don't make those determinations. The can, the Montgomery County, uh, County Public School System does, and the Board of Education does. The only thing that they have shared with us is that obviously those lists are are um, you know it's transient, meaning that people will come on those lists and go off those lists uh, over time as parents become, well, I, you know, I was on the list and I decided that I don't want to have my kids go back anymore. It's too close to the end of the year where some people will come on and say, you know what, I feel now comfortable coming on, you know, coming back into school. So please add me on. And so um, obviously, and, and I think this is, this is definitely true. Uh, we've been very, you know, we, we, we believe that in-person in education is, is the best option for students. And obviously that, you know, we want, uh, we encourage, you know, we certainly have encouraged MCPS to, to support those efforts at the same time. Uh, they obviously have built forward systems that included students who answered the survey. And, you know, obviously they're now trying to work those students into the, these additional students into a plan that was formed under different circumstances. And so it's, you know, obviously um, for them to decide, but obviously um, we, we are working with them, encouraging them and, and supporting them in, 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 in accomplishing that. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. We have uh, some questions from Rebecca Tan from the Washington Post for uh, the three officials. Rebecca. Thank you. My question is a little bit broader today. Um, so, County Executive, you said that we're, we're coming up to, to triggering that last phase of reopening in the county. Uh, and I'm curious to know, you know, what, what happens after that? You know, what is the county's pandemic response going to look like? after that point and then, you know, will, will the county lift its state of emergency at some point? Well, the, the county's operating under the governor's state of emergency, so we mm -hmm. expect the governor to lift his state of emergency. People speculate wildly about when that date is. I'm not going to speculate, but they certainly think that's coming to an end shortly. Um, shortly could be, you know, a month or two months. I don't think it's happening this afternoon, but who knows? Um, <laughs> I saw Travis tilt his head. Uh, so, um, so we're, you know, we're still under that state of emergency. There are, you know, some things that will, um, you know, we're going to continue to look at capacity, particularly at least when it comes to, you know, our own places of work. I mean, the good news, you know, one of the things we've talked about is we're, we're hoping to go back and maintain much of the teleworking that we've already been doing. You know, we found that it worked. And rather than assuming everybody comes back and then start from square one and figure out who teleworks, we're actually looking at it from reverse and asking ourselves who needs to come back and how often do they need to come back. Um, so county government may look a little bit different. Um, the, the good news about that is it A, might lead us to being able to shrink our footprint a little bit. It'll certainly reduce our carbon impact as people come in less often. And... Uh, it um, it proved well during this whole crisis that actually it worked pretty well. 
So I'm, you know, I'm mm-hmm. thinking that, you know, the county government may actually look a little bit different where we need front facing people, they'll be there, but we may not need everybody, everybody who's not front facing some of those may be able to do a lot of their work uh, without actually having to come into the offices here. So that's one change that I think you're going to see. And, uh, you know, it, it comes goes along with our evaluating, you know, the necessity of positions. Obviously, we feel we've been able to do a lot of things without filling positions over the last year. And so we're asking departments and the, and the workforce to think about, you know, how would we run this if we didn't fill every space? What, you know, what would we need to do to make sure that people can deliver what's expected um, under possibly a little bit different circumstances? So those are, you know, some, you know, big level changes. Um, I think, you know, we're going to have to continue to be vigilant, but, you know, the most vigilant resources lie in the hands of the state. We're going to want to know, since it doesn't appear we'll achieve herd immunity, we're going to need to know, continue to know where the cases are and how many they are, and we're going to need to know what the variants are. I mean, the last thing we need is to be caught by pandemic phase two that turns into be a turns out to be a major problem because we went to sleep at the wheel. And I don't think we're not planning on going to sleep. And we're hoping that the state government and the federal government take a lesson from this and realize you have to be on top of viruses all the time. You you cannot respond and think you're gonna magically turn things around. I mean we were so fortunate that some work had been done at a base level that allowed um, vaccines to be developed in record time, but you can't count on that for everything. And so we we really, at least I feel, that there has to be a level of preparedness and a level of information that we just didn't have before. Because this, this is horrible going through this once, it would be a crime to have to go through this a second time. And since we know people will not get fully vaccinated, we have to watch what happens even more so. Got it. Um, and anything to add from Dr. Sada, Dr. Yales? Yeah, I, 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 obviously, in addition to the things County Executive said, we all, we're going to have, obviously, one, even once we get to this, you know, this magical 50% benchmark, and we're still going to have hundreds of thousands of people unvaccinated, as the County Executive said, we've got to try and encourage as many of those people to get vaccinated as possible. But in addition to that, and, and the County Executive in his opening comments talked about some of these things, the end of the virus does not represent the end of the, um, you know, <clears throat> challenges around housing, the challenges around mental health, helping MCPS through our programming and rec and libraries to address long-term learning loss. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges, getting increasing consumer confidence to come back out and come to our businesses, for example. Like we've got a lot of work in this recovery that the end of COVID-19 represents a, an important important milestone where we where we stop the proverbial bleeding. But we've got a lot of we've got a long road ahead in terms of getting ahead, getting people uh, to feel um, more comfortable and confident in in reintroducing into society and addressing the long term trauma uh, to to our to our residents and our businesses uh, that COVID has inflicted. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rebecca. We have one more question, Corey Smith with NBC4, and uh, it is for you, Dr. Gales, and maybe for the CE as well. Corey? Yeah, thanks, Lorna. Uh, real quick, uh, can you all just confirm the, that the percentage threshold to move to phase three? I believe I maybe saw 60% thrown out in a report somewhere. Is it 50% or is it 60%? Uh, and then the, the, the second question is, um, during yesterday's meeting, I believe it was Dr. Gales who, who basically told the public, look, you control your own destiny when it comes to getting enough folks vaccinated in order to move into that, I guess, full reopening for lack of a better terms. Uh, I was wondering if Dr. Gales can just kind of put a finer point on that. What is the message as we see a new cohort come online uh, to the public about getting vaccinated uh, in the effort to get to that full reopening? Thank you, Corey, for your questions. Uh, to your first question, uh, I want to clarify a little bit. The percentages are a little bit mixed. So for our second phase, it would be 60% of our residents receiving at least one dose, the first dose of the vaccine. Phase three would be 50% of our residents being fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated being defined as you have received either both doses of Pfizer or Moderna, 
or one dose of Dotson and Dotson, and two weeks after that point, because we know that uh, the, the data tells us that you achieve your maximum protection level or maximum level of immunity after two weeks following the administration of that second dose or that first dose of the Johnson and Johnson. So that's how we're defining, those are the thresholds and that's how we're defining fully vaccinated for phase three with the 50%. Now to your other question, as it relates to the message to folks, you, you said it already, uh, and this extends to the last question from Rebecca to the county executive and Dr. Stoddard, is that we, our response doesn't stop when we hit 60% or 50%. That tells us we still have 40% of our population who still needs to get a dose, and it tells us we still have 50% of our population who has not been vaccinated and doesn't have that maximal level of protection. And that tells us that we will still continue, uh, at least for the short term, to have to keep measures in place or keep our surveillance in place at a minimum to track new infections and to track transmission mm -hmm. so that we don't see an increase in cases and a potential wave of new cases, particularly given the influence of the variant cases that we've talked about for the last several months. I mean, we've got documented cases of all of the variants that have been identified and those of concern uh, or some of those new ones that have been defined by the WHO. And so we've got to continue to do our due diligence in making sure we track those, we continue to do contact tracing, and we continue to be able to follow the guidance from the federal level and the state to be able to uh, put that into policies that impact and hopefully keep our residents safe. So that's a long answer and a shorter version of that to say is get vaccinated. You do control your, your destiny. If you've been vaccinated, tell your friends, tell your family members to get vaccinated. And if you are at home yourself who ha and haven't been vaccinated, please come in and get it. We've got lots of opportunities available now for you to access the vaccine. And the sooner you get it, the more folks we can get protected and the sooner we can feel more comfortable and confident moving forward with reopening other aspects of our society. So, so I'll just add, you know, we've been saying from the beginning that this is something that human beings completely control. You know, if we had, if we had done the right things a year, 14 months ago, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. And, you know, the fact that we didn't adopt masks early and distancing early, you can attribute a small part of it to what we didn't know but you can attribute a large part of it to what we weren't willing to do as a society. And so, you know, we set ourselves up for a situation that is worse than it needed to be. There still would have been, you know, lots of death and lots of misery, but it didn't have to be what it was. And uh, I will, you know, always <laughs> wish that, that we had had different leadership at the federal level that had actually paid attention to what they were being told. That said, you know, at 60% of the population vaccinated, that is 400,000 people in Montgomery County not vaccinated. And while some portion of that are, you know, zero to five-year-olds that I don't anticipate, you know, circulating widely in the community and going to stores and stuff like that, a whole bunch of that is people who are, you know, are going to be out shopping, people out working, and 400,000 is a large, lot of targets for the virus to find. And that's why it's really important that, you know, we push our vaccinations. You know, I would be happy if we could get to 80% vaccinated. Um, then, you know, the, the, you, every, the greater the percent vaccinated, the less places there are for the virus to jump. And 80% would be a halfway decent number. 60% is good. And, you know, probably right now nationally, it's really good. But um, we've got to go beyond that. So we are not stopping there. You will not see any difference in the degree we try to get people to come in and get vaccinated. And hopefully as people see everybody, you know, basically being well, as their friends get vaccinated and they don't get sick and they don't come down with COVID and, you know, there aren't, you know, major health effects, hopefully that'll convince some of the reluctance to come in. Because if you don't get vaccinated, um, you're vulnerable to getting it. And when you get it, you're vulnerable to spreading it. And if you're circulating with other people who, for whatever reason, share your view that people shouldn't be vaccinated, there is the potential that they will wind up getting COVID the hard way. And I don't want to achieve herd immunity by making people sick. Um, when that was a suggestion back in the previous regime, um, the death toll associated with people getting sick to achieve herd immunity was astounding. 
and the number of people who would get sick and the long-term effects, those are not numbers we want to visit. So I'd prefer to get my herd immunity out of the vaccine than out of people getting sick. And I just hope people think about this, watch what's happening around them. Don't put a political lens on it. Uh, pretend that the source was a completely neutral robot or something, but just observe what you see. And if you don't see people getting sick and you don't see people dying from the vaccine, which you will not see, then think twice about your decision not to get vaccinated. That's That would help all of us get to a better place and help this community recover faster. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. And with that, we have to say goodbye and good afternoon for today. Thank you for joining us, reporters. Thank you to the three officials, and we'll see you soon. Stay safe. Thank you.